Good evening, um, everyone, and thank you very much for the uh, attending our um, educational um, activity for the ILAE EMR. Um, today is the, our uh, Epicare um, cases about temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, challenges from semiology to um, surgical um, intervention. Um, it would be have a great pleasure to have our um, panelist, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Abdel Mahdi, um, Professor of Pediatric and Associate Chair, uh, Department of Pediatric uh, and Director of Neurology Ch Children's Mercy uh, Kansas City, um, and uh, Professor Christian uh, Kaufman, um, who's the Chief Neurosurgery um, in Children uh, Mercy University of Missouri at um, Kansas City. So um, the, the session will be uh, based on uh, four um, uh, cases that will be discussed by uh, four presenters and I will be introducing them um, um, as the cases are presented. Um, and we will have um, a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you had any um, questions regarding the presentations um, and uh, also this session will be recorded uh, so it, it will be available at later time for review for those who could not attend or uh, for uh, later uh, revision. Um, and this is also um, a CME accredited, so you will have your certificate at the end of the session. So the objective of this session is uh, to identify and, um, the semiology of uh, temporal lobe epilepsy and um, identify what are the um, uh, at least basic investigations that is required and what are the surgical um, intervention uh, that is uh, needed for such cases. And then we'll tackle also some of the um, uh, facilities that's it's not available in the um, uh, lower um, resources uh, countries um, and, um, and how to tackle those cases. So I'll begin with the uh, first um, case, uh, first presentation, which will be presented by, by Dr. Uh, Sal Sabil uh, Abu Al uh, Ayazim. He's a lecturer of neurology, uh, Cairo University. Dr. Sal Sabil, you can start your presentation. Uh, good evening. Okay, thank uh, thank you for the introduction. Just a minute. Uh, good evening, dear professor. Uh, my name is Salsa. Bilal Azim, lecturer of Neurology Kai University and fellow of European Board of Neurology. Today, I will present a case, uh, our first case study. Uh, Fatma SS, 31 year old female, right handed, and significant family history, past and perinatal history. Seizure onset start at age of 13 years old, duration two to three minutes. Seizure type focal with impaired awareness. It starts with attack of right upper limb dystonic posture and right and left upper limb automatism and chewing, infrequent evolved to bilateral tonic clonic seizure. Post-ectal sign, her left hand move in a bizarre manner together with left lower limb followed by post-ectal sleep. anti seizure medication start with um, now levotrestam 3,000 mg, carbamazepine 400 mg, lacosamide 400 mg, longest seizure-free period one and a half months, usual seizure frequency two to three per month, no history of status, time of occurrence diurnal and nocturnal and precipitating factor emotional stress and missed doses. This is her semiology. I start at right upper limb dystonic posture. Then left upper limb automatism.
slide had turned to right. Then it will do bilateral tonic clonic procedure. At the end of the event, asymmetric ending in the left lower lump. So our first question, how would you localize and lateralize the seizure based on semiology? Right temporal, right extra temporal, left temporal, left extra temporal, undetermined. All right, answer. Left temporal is the right question as the stonic right upper lamp. Um, so lateralized to left and the stonic upper, right upper lamp and automatasmic uh, in left upper lamp, so in left temporal region. Our second question, from the semiology, what's the most possible lateralizing sign? Right upper lamp, the stonic posture, left upper lamp, automatism, head turn to right, one and two, three and four. Okay, the right answer is right upper limb dystonic posture and automatism of left one and two. Yes, correct answer, 100%. So uh, general examination and neurological examination was normal. Inter-XL EEG show left anterior temporal A1, F7, sharp and uh, slow wave discharges. XL EEG show left anterior temporal A1, F73, rhythmic sharp wave. We proceed to MRI brain epilepsy protocol. Our next question, what is the MRI brain epilepsy protocol um, lesion? Right, medial temporal sclerosis, left medial temporal sclerosis, right frontal focal cortical dysplasia, left frontal focal cortical dysplasia, one and three, two and four. The answer left medial temporal sclerosis, 60%, and two and four, 50% is two and four, left medial temporal sclerosis, left vocal cortical dysplasia. We saw um, this is the lesion, left frontal lesion, transmental sign, focal cortical dysplasia, and left temporal lesion, medial temporal sclerosis in the form of left hippocampal signal and the blaring in gray white matter junction in left temporal pool. So we have two lesions. So what's our next step to confirm our hypothesis? PET MRI, co-registration, neuropsychological assessment, invasive EEG monitoring, Excel SPECT. PET MRI co-registration, 49%, and neuropsychological assessment, 15%, invasive EEG, 16%, Excel SPECT, 
Our next step was PET MRI co registration, which show hypometabolism of left temporal bull, which is concordant with temporal lesion and seizure semiology and EEG. Then we perform a neuropsychological assessment, which is part of pre surgical evaluation and which show verbal memory and the executive function impairment. So in this case, MRI brain epilepsy protocol show two lesions in left frontal and left temporal region. But based on semiology and the interictal and ictal EEG, our hypothesis on the location of the epileptogenic zone mostly in left temporal region and confirmed by PET MRI co-registration. So we proceed to surgical treatment. Surgical treatment done. 10th of April, 2023. And guided by ECOG, preoperative show, um, which preoperative show hippocampal This is short. ECOG postoperative was free, no intraoperative or postoperative complication, and pathology, focal cortical dysplasia, last OB, and outcome angle 1A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sensabil. Uh, so if I would ask Dr. Ahmed Abin Mati, if you can just discuss the semiology um, of the case. Yeah. So first, thank you for presenting the case. I think it, uh, it's a very nice case to highlight um, some of the most common types of epilepsy, some of the most common types of lesional epilepsy, which is temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, as you very nicely highlighted, Dr. Salsabil, it's very important to have that concordance of the data. So um, as you showed in the video, the very first movement or the very first change that uh, that young lady had uh, physically was that dystonic posture of her right upper extremity. Um, it wasn't clear from the presentation if she had any aura or any any um, uh, non-motor movements, but the very first motor movement that happened was that right um, upper extremity dystonic posture. And um, that is of a, of a very high localizing uh, clinical uh, signal. So it, it, it actually lateralized it, as you nicely highlighted, to the left hemisphere. It doesn't by itself, that very first movement doesn't by itself localize it. Um, however, as she progresses through the seizure, she later on will, ha she has some of those automatism, uh, then she later will have some adversive um, head deviation to the right side, um, all of which is kind of localizing it more into the temporal lobe that typically will have that automatism, bilateral automatism, and uh, very shortly she's gonna have that adversive head deviation. So um, she's telling us, I am a left hemisphere, then later a bit into the seizure, as you start having that adverse of head deviation, uh, there you go. And um, later um, she spreads to have bilateral tonic clonic. So as everybody on this call knows, um, it doesn't matter how the seizure ends, it is super important how the seizure starts. So the very first physical sign was that right hand, right upper extremity, which lateralizes, it doesn't localize, as she progresses further, that's when it became a little bit more clear, suggestive, and I'm, I'm, I want to be clear, suggestive, not indicating, but suggestive that it's a, it's a left temporal uh, lobe seizure. And now she's into the bilateral tonic clinic, as Dr. Selsabil highlighted. This is, this is neither localizing nor lateralizing. It's simply, it means that things spread all over the place. Thank you so much for your comment, Dr. Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Through the poll questions, actually, there were some some really um, good and rather challenging questions. That I think it's it, it brings brings a lot of points to um, to this case. Um, um, I, I think we already addressed the the right hand part of the poll question as well as the where it, where does it land. The third question, which was about the MRI finding, um, so clearly she does have both. She has the left frontal focal cortical dysplasia in addition to the temporal lobe with that, um, with that uh, um, um, T2 hyperintensity and a rather smaller um, head of hippocampus. So she, she has both, both lesions. And the question becomes, which one is, um, is an ictal zone as opposed to a spread zone? And, um, and this is where um, the next step of studies would help a lot. Um, Dr. Kaufman and our neurosurgeons 
to for the implantation part as well as for the the um, the better localization of of the potential resection. This is this is really a, a, the next question. I think is a really good question. What is what is the next step? And this is where um, um, I personally am always interested in hearing Dr. Kaufman's um, input on this. Uh, this is where it's very important having that team approach: uh, the epileptologist, the neurosurgeon, the neuropsychologist, um, as well as the neuroradiologist, um, to decide what is my next step. And um, to the point uh, made earlier, we need that concordance of the data. The clinical features by itself is not enough. The EEG by itself is not enough, even though the EEG is quite telling and it matches very nicely with, uh, with the seizure itself. It tells or it kind of further confirms or indicates that it's, um, it's a left temporal lobe seizure. Now, we need a concordance of the data, especially that we have this left frontal uh, focal cortical dysplasia. And um, it can be any and all of the above. It's a matter of what do we want to do next? Um, and honestly, this has a lot to do with the availability of the technology at the center. Some centers might have ictal spec. Uh, probably I would have personally picked ictal spec, to be honest, as my, my top priority. Um, if it's not available, um, PET will be helpful um, to be able at least to, to further better localize from a metabolic standpoint which side of the brain or which part um, of the brain that's, uh, that's most likely to be um, the ictal zone or the, or the ictal part. Um, sometimes we will need um, um, invasive EEG monitoring, um, even in um, focal uh, um, lesional um, epilepsy, if it's a large lesion or if it's multiple lesions, uh, it might be helpful to further confirm what's, um, what's the best thing. So this question actually is a really good question. I don't believe there's a one right answer to it. Um, uh, it depends on the on the center as well. So, and I'm really interested to hear Dr. Kaufman's um, input in that as well. Dr. Kaufman, can you hear me? Looks like he might have a yes, some second. Like can hear you. Yeah, okay. Sorry, Doctor. My, did you add, I, I might've missed the question there. Did you ask yeah. a specific question? So, so I was, I was, so um, we're talking about the, the next step after the EEG and the uh, clinical epidemiology as well as MRI, uh, whenever there is a, a lesional epilepsy, um, from a neurosurgical standpoint, what, what do you prefer as the next, uh, next step? Is it, um, PET with core registration with MRI, um, neuropsychological testing, invasive monitoring, ictal spec. Um, and I realize this can really vary case by case, but in general, what's, what's your typical approach? How would you like to go in order for uh, next step after, after the EEG, MRI, and clinical semiology in a case of a lesional epilepsy? Yeah, so very good question. And yes, to some extent it does depend on what, you know, what the situation is with, with the patient, their age, um, essentially what you have, but you alluded to it earlier, no single piece of data is, is determinate. Uh, you want a concordance of data. You want, as we often tell patients, all the arrows pointing in the same direction as, as this is a likely focal surgical target that we can do something about. Um, and sometimes you do not have complete concordance of data. Sometimes you have three out of four, four out of five, um, but optimally, you, you want as much concordance as possible. Um, I would not say there is a necessary globally specific, you know, additional perfect modality, whether it's SPECT, uh, whether it's PET, whether it is um, MAG data, but it, any, any additional piece of concordance is uh, a, a stronger indication that you're likely to have a successful surgery. Without getting too philosophic as surgeons, one of our, where literally our daily battle is a battle of, we call non-maleficence versus beneficence, where we say, okay, above all else, do no harm, which is one important you know, ideal. And the other is this idea of beneficence is what can we do to help someone? And those are not necessarily the same thing. 
And so we want to make sure, you know, by all means, whatever we're doing for a patient and to a patient is not going to hurt them. And of course, much in favor of as possible. So every piece of additional data is something that we can continue to stack the odds in favor of not being able to. Dr. Kaufman, I think I think we lost. A, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty here in gear. Um, but I, I, I think we got we got your your point, which um, I totally agree with. It has to be that concordance of the data, and depending on the on the case, the age, as well as what we're trying to do, um, we err towards this side of caution, making sure that we're not we're not causing any any harm. Um, I believe this was a this was a great case to highlight a uh, lesional uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, it highlights a couple of very important points. Um, um, this is a patient with drug resistant epilepsy. And by, def by defined by LAE, she failed two properly chosen, properly dosed medications that she was having still seizure. So um, it was, I, I really, I really like the approach that the next step was, okay, let's look, is she a surgical candidate? So as we're going down the algorithm, drug resistant epilepsy, next question is, is the patient a surgical candidate? And in this case, we have a lesion, we have concordance of the data. So yes, she's a surgical candidate. Then the next question and the next layer is, what kind of studies do I, am I missing? Am I done with MRI, EEG, and uh, and clinical stimuli. Sometimes the answer is yes, that's all I need. And I have uh, mesothemporal sclerosis or focal cortical dysplasia, and this is all what I need. In this particular case, there was that focal cortical dysplasia in the frontal lobe. So I needed something more to further pinpoint me as, uh, and I like Dr. Kaufman's analogy, kind of all the errors directing me into that same direction. That next step further confirmed that it was that temporal lobe, um, T2 hyperintensity, and that's, um, we saw that EEG, uh, the electrocorticography, um, showing those um, um, uh, spikes in that ictal zone, and after resection, things got quiet, and that's where you see the, the, the angle one. So I think it's, at, um, it's a great case highlighting focal uh, lesional epilepsy with post-resection uh, complete resolution of seizures. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdelmata and Professor uh, Kaufman. So we'll move to the next case, uh, will be, which will be presented by Dr. Uh, Muna Abdel Fattah from uh, University, uh, Cairo University. And I would uh, request you, Dr. Muna, after finishing your um, description of the semiology of the seizure, would like you to stop so then we can hear the input from uh, our um, experts and then we'll move with the investigations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fatma, for your introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to present our second case. She's a female, 26 years old, right-handed, with positive family history of epilepsy. Her uncle with negative perinatal and febrile seizure or any previous uh, relevant past history. Her seizure started at the age of three with focal aware cognitive seizure, lasted about two to three minutes. It started by subject, subjective sensation of body movement, followed by arrestal behavior with impaired awareness and pallor, then oral and manual automatism, then turn around herself as described by her family, with infrequent evolving to bilateral tonic clonic seizure, and post-ictally she had fatigue, sleep, and headache. As we can see, uh, her seizure semiology in the video during our EEG recording, she started out of sleep, sense of body movement, then assumed started by left upper limb automatism and assumed that tonic posturing on her left upper limb. Then started her movement by turning around herself. then it's the end of her seizure and it lasted about less than two minutes uh, our first poll question uh, from your opinion of the attendees from the semiology what would be the lateralization
Okay, there's a difference among our attendees about right or left or non-lateralizing. Okay, um, actually her right upper limb dystonic pushing would most likely lateralize to the left. And uh, what about localization? Mesial temporal, lateral temporal, dorsal lateral frontal or non-localizing? Okay, mesial temporal. Most likely chosen choice was mesial temporal followed by dorsolateral frontal. Okay, if we could have a chance now to hear from our expert, his comment about the seizure. Thank you, Dr. Manasa. Dr. Abdel Mata, if you kindly uh, just uh, have your input on the semiology of the seizure. Yeah, so this is, as everybody can tell, this is not as straightforward as the previous case. So. Um, uh, she clearly had, it was out of sleep um, or immediately after she woke up from sleep. Um, and if you can play the video, please. Um, yes. she, mm -hmm. she starts having some automatism um, and her automatism actually is starting left and right side uh, by a lot of, she does have a little bit of a more posturing on the right side later on, but at the very beginning, she's she's um, starting on, on both sides. So I probably would not would not fault those who chose uh, non-lateralizing. Um, her seizure is not very clear, not like the previous one. The previous one was very straightforward. This one, she does have some um, automatism on both sides. Um, she doesn't have that dystonic posture that you, you, you saw in the last patient, didn't have any adverse of head deviation. The pattern of her turning, even though it happened further down the seizure, it's not at the beginning of the seizure, so the by itself, it cannot be a lateralizing sign because it probably spread by now. But yes, it does localize to the left hemisphere for sure. Um, but that ha didn't happen at the very beginning of the seizure. So th this is this is a rather uh, not as straightforward as the last case because it's it's not very clearly lateralizing given the bilateral automatism, the lack of very clear uh, dystonic or, or posturing it to to one side or the or the other. Okay, thank you. Uh... Now we, uh, her anti-seizure medication, she was on Levitracetam 2,000 milligram per day, Valproate 1,000 milligram per day, Carbamazepine 800 milligram, and Lacuzamide 50 milligram. She was on four anti-seizure medication with frequent seizure on a daily basis. Longest seizure-free period during her whole life was 10 days. History for status once, seizure occurred nocturnal and diurnal. With, uh, and was precipitated usually with sleep deprivation, mental and emotional stress, mistosis, no comorbidities, insignificant general and neurological examination. Her interictal EEG showed bilateral independent uh, temporal epileptic form discharge in the form of sharp slow wave. Our first epoch showed right temporal discharge, and the next one showed left temporal discharge. Then her ictal onset, uh, it was a uh, rhythmic sharp theta activity at the left temporal, mainly anterior part, as we can see at the F7 T1. Um, her brain imaging MRI epilepsy protocol showed an intraaxial uh, cortical lesion with bubbly appearance, uh, suggestive of uh, a denet with uh, at the inferior temporal gyrus. as we can see, and the extent of the lesion in, within the temporal loop, as we can see from inferior to superior, and its extension to the lateral part of the temporal loop. Her neuropsychological assessment showed the average uh, IQ with intact visual and verbal memory, and most of her assessment were uh, adequate and intact. According to our multidisciplinary uh, team discussion, her semiology was lateralizing to the left, interictal was bilateral, but her ictal was on the left as well, and MRI was on the left temporal, as we saw. Accordingly, the hypothesis of the localization of the epileptic form zone uh, based on semiology, ictal, EEG, and imaging were concordant on the left temporal. So we proceeded to navigation guided legionectomy. It was done one year ago, after which patient is angle one classification. The histopathology confirmed the net. 
Her post-operative assessment showed a remarkable improvement in her most of cognitive functions regarding IQ, working memory, processing speed index, and as well as her verbal memory and executive function. And now we would like to hear from our experts their comments about the significance of bilateral interictal activity for epilepsy surgery and the value of electrocortography in temporal loop lesion epilepsy. Thank you, Dr. Mona. That, that's, a, that's another really great case. Um, and as we're talking about a treatment algorithm here, so as you highlighted, she does have drug resistant epilepsy. So that's going to be my very first point to highlight. She failed multiple medications. She's still having seizures. The next thing is all her seizures are the same semiology. And this is another really important one. So I'm getting closer to that yeah. to answer the question. Can this be a resective candidate? Can, that, can this be an epilepsy surgery candidate? So, so far, nothing tells me no. Um, the next part is her semiology, even though I agree with you, it is suggestive of it being more left uh, lateralized, but it can be a little bit confusing. Um, then the EG comes to show me inner ictals bilaterally. That in itself does not rule out the possibility of epilepsy surgery. Dr. Kaufman and I, and many other epilepsy centers, as you highlighted, even in this particular case, um, patients can absolutely have a very successful epilepsy surgery despite having the bilateral interictal activity. So bilateral interactive activity will happen under one of um, the following situations. Either I have a single lesion, which I believe was in this case, being having that mesial or that medial extension to it, it can have the contralateral dystrogus happening out of the same lesion. So what I mean by that, that left mesial temporal structure was showing me that the stroges on the right side, because it's a lot easier and closer for it to reach that right-sided scalp than sometimes on the left side. So that, that can be an, 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 an issue. In some other cases, the patient might have other independent interictal activity, but that doesn't mean they're causing seizures. They are typically different in the morphology. Um, and I know we talked about this in previous, in previous um, symposia. The morphology of the discharge can really help me a lot um, answering the question, is it coming out of the same exact focus or different foci? Um, but for example, sometimes patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, they might have a, a rather um, clear lesion or rather clear uh, cause for the, um, for the seizure with a focal ischemia. They might have some little gliosis on the contralateral side that are not causing seizures, but they might show me some interactive activity. So that in itself, should not prohibit me, should not stop me from moving forward with the, with the surgical um, planning. I need to further confirm, is it really causing trouble or not? And I can confirm that like we talked from the previous case. Um, I can use some of my functional studies and sometimes even um, like stereotactic EEG, um, intermittent EEG, uh, electric cortography um, to assess, are we, are we having any seizures coming out of that um, contralateral side or not? Um, so this is, this is very um, classical, and we encounter this all the time, where um, you might not have immediate um, straightforward concordance of the data, but as you go further deeper into it, you start seeing that concordance happen. And um, yes, this patient um, would have been a great candidate and is a great candidate for applied surgery and sounds like that's what, um, that's what you guys did. Um, Dr. Kaufman, I wonder if you have anything you'd like to add on this, or um, what's your take on... Um, having that significance, um, is that something that prohibit you or worry you when you see bilateral um, interictal activity to move forward with epilepsy surgery? Yeah, so, so obviously great question because it happens a lot. Um, and uh, to the same point that you made, does not necessarily eliminate someone as a good candidate. What it basically tells you is, is proceed with caution, <clears throat> both in how you assess the patient, you make sure you thoroughly get as many of those arrows to line up as possible. And also make sure when you counsel a patient or counsel a family that they understand that we do have some activity elsewhere, it could be a spread, could be independent, and that may affect outcomes. But it is not, as you said, something that limits someone from being at least further evaluated with surgery. One of the things you indicated that's very useful, particularly in a more modern age, is stereotactic depth electrodes. They can be done with minimal risk, and they can be done with a high degree of uh, assurance that you have uh, either a spread pattern or you have something that may be an independent generator. There are some surgical considerations when you have uh, 
disparate locations as far as where we can reach within a sort of uh, the scope of surgery. If someone's lesion is, or potential other lesion is far distant, meaning opposite hemisphere, opposite side of the head, meaning frontal versus occipital, um, or deep bitemporal, those can be more challenging logistically, but oftentimes we can find ways to target them safely and really be able to kind of sort out, is there something here that is just focal to one spot, or are we talking about areas that have multiple sources? If there is still multiple sources, that is not always an indication that you can't do surgery. Um, there still may be what looks like a small independent generator, but if someone overwhelmingly has dramatic, clear uh, origination from one center, when we're looking at an angle classification outcome of have we improved this person's life, uh, it's quite possible that you can still safely do a focal resection knowing that there's possibly small other generators and alternate locations, which is certainly something that is common with the pathology of cortical dysplasia. We know cortical dysplasia, despite the common term being focal, is probably not as focal as we think it is. And we know that there can be hidden other dysplasias that can be independent generators that can pop up, but those that does not prevent someone from having a successful surgery that positively impacts their life. Yeah, I, I think um, you highlight some really great points. And uh, I think that kind of really uh, also answers the following question. Um, uh, what is the value of electrocorticography? And I think you highlight on a very important point um, as far as the prognosis, as we um, are doing the electrocorticography at the end of the recording and at the end of the resection, what type of activity are we seeing? And that can help um, to some extent predict what kind of outcome we might have and what kind of, what kind of, what kind of prognosis that patient might, um, might have. But um, um, I honestly also want to be very realistic. I, I totally understand. And um, we know that ideal state, uh, or if, if I have all the resources, yes, every epilepsy surgery case should have electrocorticography with it, lesional or non-lesional, for the reasons that Dr. Kaufman highlighted. But I also realize in some, in some um, regions, in some centers, um, I might not have the availability of electrocardiography. And it becomes a really tough, tough situation for the treating um, physicians because um, I either want to wait for the ideal state to happen to get all my electrocardiography, um, stereotactic EEG, get my brain lab and all of that, all that stuff. Or in some cases, um, and some of the good examples for that, like focal cortical dysplasia um, or mesotemporal sclerosis, where I can see only a very isolated lesion that um, ideally I would love to have the ECOG, but if I don't have the resources, it is, it, is, it, is, um, it is fine. It is okay to go for that resection rather than just waiting um, until I get, I get those resources. There was actually a very recent article that came out of India, um, kind of showing the outcome in lesional, uh, focal, very focal, and I wanna be very clear, very focal, um, epilepsy, not like the two cases that we discussed so far, but if it's a very focal um, cortical dysplasia or a very isolated mesotemporal sclerosis without anything else, um, with clear concordance of all the data, uh, they have done actually the resections with similar outcomes when they randomized those patients, or rather actually it was a retrospective, but when they looked uh, retrospectively, there was no statistical significance in the outcome for those who were electrocorticography done or non-electrocorticography done. So um, we got to also be mindful, of course, of the resources and the region and what centers we're working at. Thank you very much right. for the, uh, your input. So I have one question. So like, you know, like many centers in the region, they might not have the full uh, resources of comprehensive epilepsy centers. So like in such patient uh, where there is a clear lesion and the interrectal EEGs are showing bilateral temporal um, um, epileptiform discharges. So what are the, you know, at least the, um, the investigations that you might need uh, before you have the resection and that you will be comfortable to do the surgery? Um, I have my thoughts. I'm actually, I'm going to tell you my thoughts from an epilepsy, but I'm also very interested in Dr. Kaufman's from, from a neurosurgery standpoint. Um, um, SPECT or ictal SPECT, uh, if available, it's a great resource because it will be very nicely um, helping to localize the onset of the seizure. And this, this is very helpful in, in non-lesional epilepsy as well as large lesional epilepsy. If I have a large lesion or multiple lesions that I wanna find 
my ictal zone in this big, huge forest, um, uh, ictal specs can be can be of, of a lot of help. Probably, uh, and again, this is assuming I don't have stereotactic EG and I do not have electrocardiography. Um, if I can send this patient to a center that can do that, that would be my choice. If this is not an availability, this is something that I cannot do, then the next best thing is at least get a spec scan um, to correlate it with the lesion that I have on an MRI, um, as well as the clinical semiology. If this is a non-lesional case with the clinical semiology uh, non-committing, um, non uh, the EG showing bilateral, I probably would not resect this patient to or Dr. Kaufman's earlier point, uh, do no harm. So I probably would not select, would not resect this patient unless I have the proper resources. Dr. Kaufman, what, what, I'm interested in your thoughts from a neurosurgery standpoint. Yeah, uh, again, to, to somewhat mirror your comments, it, that entirely hinges on the availability of electrocorticography and particularly you know, ideally stereo EEG. If, if the only data you have is, is EEG and MRI and nothing else, I, you, know, you still may, you know, with the appropriate MRI and appropriate EEG, absolutely move forward with a surgical, a further surgical investigation if you can do electrocorticography. Um, if that isn't available, then yes, that's a very different situation. While other studies, SPECT being pretty good, PET being pretty good, MEG being pretty good, none of them have the uh, surgical localization that you can pinpoint and say, ah, this, this surgically is what we can target uh, and safely uh, and effectively be able to remove uh, uh, some kind of you know, uh, focal generator. Uh, so there is no specific study that say, yep, yeah, this is going to convince me by itself for sure that someone's going to be able to successfully undergo surgery. I would agree that SPEC is uh, of the remaining modalities is quite good, but I will tell you um, between SPECT and PET, we often see very different data there um, that we don't always get the arrows to line up. Um, uh, so a lot of it's still going to hinge on the availability of electrocorticography. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dr. Ahmed, can I ask, yes. Uh, can I ask uh, to the semiology as a can we label the semiology of uh, our patient as a gyratory seizure, which uh, rotated around body axis? Uh, uh, yeah. Then that's a or... that's a yeah that's a great question, Dr. Nermeen. And um and as as you know, the seizures can spread into many different areas. Um, so it looks like it clearly spread further to the. Uh, frontal lobe with more of a gyratory seizure, but this is not the onset. It's, it kind of it's kind of spread there. Uh, very similar to a lot of seizures that sometimes will will uh, travel to the supplemental motor area, giving me the fencing position or the figure of four. But if the seizure didn't start this way, um, I would not consider this as a localizing sign. So it doesn't it doesn't it it traveled there or it spread there, but it didn't start there. Um, so I, I would start with the very very initial clinical onset, either um, a motor change, um, sensory change, or some even, even some, some psychogenic change, that, that probably what I would put my localization um, um, uh, weight on. Uh, in her case, she started doing that rotary movement, probably at least a good 30 seconds or so into the seizure. So this could have been a spread zone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mana and the panel. Thank you. And we'll move now to the third presentation. Uh, Dr. Wajd al uh, She's an assistant consultant, pediatric neurology, King uh, Fahad Specialist Hospital, Denmark. And just while the uh, presentations are coming up, so just to have uh, a clear message for our participant that uh, we will. Um, get your um, questions um, after the end of all four presentation uh, to be answered by our panelists. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am Wajtira Tiri. I'm assistant consultant uh, in pediatric neurology department in King Fahad Specialist Hospital in Saudi Arabia. It's my pleasure today to participate in this meeting, and I'm going to present one of our epilepsy surgery cases. 
Our patient is a nine years and five months old. He is a left-handed boy. He has normal development and he's known to have a focal epilepsy. His seizure onset started at the age of nine years, which is five months before he referred to our hospital. He has one semiology, which is a focal motor impaired awareness to bilateral tonic clonic. Described as with started with the aura of abdominal pain and raising epigastric sensation, he looks uh, confused and he will develop right arm tonic posturing and right facial twitching and left, ha uh, left hand automatism. Sometimes in progressing to bilateral clonic features, Usually, uh, he's unresponsive during his seizure and lasted between 40 to 50 seconds. His frequency was initially 10 times per day. After he started on liver acetam, he responded partially and decreased to five to six times per day. He never had a history of a status epilepticus before. His current anti-seizure medication is liver acetam, which is 500 milligram BID, which gives him 38 milligram per kg per day. And he, ne he never used any other anti-seizure medications. His past medical history was unremarkable. In his perinatal history, he was full term with normal vagina delivery and birth weight was a 3.5 kg and the history of the only history of neonatal jaundice received only phototherapy. Developmental history, he's cognitively normal. He's really performing at school. His family history, parents are first degree cousins and patient has one healthy sister and one brother. No family history of epilepsy or other neurological disorders. His neurological examination was non focal. His pre surgical evaluation and his video EEG monitoring. During his monitoring, we captured 20 seizures, nine happened during awakefulness, and 11 happened during sleep. I will start to show you his EEG. I will start with his background. His background was eight hertz and it was electric bilateral with good anterior to posterior gradient, with good reactivity to eye open and eye closure. His sleep record showed uh, synchronized symmetrical sleep, sleep spindles and vertex wave were noticed. Another epoch of his sleep record was normal sleep structure. His interaxial data showed he have a frequent of a focal discharge, which was described as a spike in the slow wave high voltage over the left front temporal head region, mainly F7, T3, and F3 with a midline, uh, with a volume conduction to the midline uh, electrode season. Sometimes this focal discharge comes in runs uh, without clinical correlation. And during sleep, this discharge activated on the same region. Also, this is another epoch of his EEG, so the same focal discharge during sleep. Now I will again show you his, uh, his EEG, e, uh, his seizure uh, clinically and electrographically. He was uh, sitting, suddenly he fell on his back with a tonic posturing of the right arms. Some fearful sound, uh, we start to hum, some twitching in his uh, right uh, right face, developed uh, clinic activity in right arm and left hand automatism, fumbling, and it seems that he passed urine during his uh, seizure. Sorry, we cannot see your presentation. Yeah, would you please open the video was it? was not clear the video maybe stop and sharing and then you share the video now it's clear the eeg yes I will restart his uh, the uh, the seizure. Suddenly he falls on his back with the right arm tonic uh, posturing, and he starts to produ uh, produce some fearful sounds with clonic activity in right arm and left hand automatism fumbling. 
and some facial twitching will notice. It seems that he during this uh, seizure, he passed also urine. And the seizure is over now. I will show you his uh, EEG, how it was started. His EEG started uh, two seconds before the clinical onset by temporal, with, uh, but higher amplitude and uh, higher, uh, uh, more rhythmic over the right temporal head region, T4, T6, followed by generalized voltage attenuation for 10 seconds, then evolved to generalize the slow delta activity, high voltage, rhythmic, uh, three to four hertz, intermixed with the spikes, and then eventually decreased in the frequency to one uh, hertz per second. And the seizure ended with a uh, post ectal slowing, focal slowing, uh, maximum over the left frontal, uh, front temporal head region. His neuroimaging, he did the MRI brain three Tesla epilepsy protocol, and this is his axial uh, flare image showed uh, lift uh, temporal uh, mass, which described as a high signal intensity uh, and bubbly appearance uh, on the lift uh, para, uh, parahippocampus uh, gyrus. This is T2 coronal image showed a mass on the lift temporal, which described as a bubbly appearance. Uh, now we're gonna have a poll. Uh, what do you think these abnormality consisting with astrocytoma or mesial temporal sclerosis, limbic encephalitis, or DNET? You have thirty seconds to answer the poll. Seems the majority they get the right answer, which is DNS. So a part of our pre-surgical evaluation, we did interactal aspect, which showed relative decrease in a perfusion of the medial aspect of the left temporal loop and left inferior frontal loop. And his external aspect showed relative hyperperfusion of the medial aspect of the left temporal loop and left inferior frontal loop. We did a PET scan and showed hypermetabolism over the left frontal and temporal loop. This is another poll. What do you think the best surgical intervention for this patient? Insertion of VNS device, left temporal loopectomy, left sided hemispherotomy, or curbus colostomy? So the answer 13 person, they uh, answered VNS device, 78 person to prolobectomy, which is the right answer. So our patient did the left temporal lobectomy under ECOG, and histopathology read that low grade glioneuronal tumor consists with ganglioglioma grade one. In the last clinic in December 2022, uh, 2022, one year after the surgery, he remains a seizure free, but he's still on his anti seizure medication. We did a follow up EEG, was normal EEG, normal backing ground, normal sleep structure, and no interactal discharge. Also, we did a follow up MRI, uh, which uh, showed no residual of the tumor uh, and stable post operative changes. So thank you for listening. And now we'll have the expert comments. Thank you, Dr. Watch. I think this is another really very interesting case and looks like um, um, a, a great resection was done. And um, it's always great to hear that angle 1A classification um, uh, for our patients. So, um, so 
from the from the description of the of the case with the semiology with the epigastric uprising and the abdominal uh, signs, so that suggests more of a mesial uh, structure. And this is more of a mesial um, type of seizure. Um, and we have a little bit of a of a lack of full concordance of the data if you, at the beginning. So as you described, um, some of the first motor changes that it, that that kid has. Uh, was that right upper extremity uh, movement. Even though it happened a little bit later into the seizure, uh, and the, as we just talked earlier, we really want to judge and we want to um, we want to localize by the very beginning, not later um, parts of the seizure, especially in mesial, uh, mesial uh, uh, type seizures. Then the EG, and I 100% agree with you, uh, there is a little bit of a right temporal lead on the EG. You see that Beta activity, if you go, if you can bring that ictal, ictal uh, EG, please. Um, on the ictal EG, you do see that right temporal, um, uh, actually during the seizure, if you can play the video a little bit. Uh, yep, right there, perfect, perfect. This, this is perfect, thank you. So if you track here, um, you'll notice that uh, um, uh, T4, T6, and even T, um, T2, uh, uh, T4, there is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an activity, but if you look up with your eyes at T3, T5, and you draw a little bit of a line. Um, this might have started just a, just a tad earlier. Um, so it's it's looking bi bilateral. Um, we can argue that it started a little bit earlier on the left side or on the right side, but it's it's happening uh, very close to each other bilaterally. It is a higher amplitude on the right side, but we also gotta gotta remember that the right uh, skull is thinner than the than the left one, and that's that's where we're gonna have um, uh, we can have higher amplitude up to fifty percent. Um, then the MRI came to show, okay, this left uh, left sided lesion, and um, and I agree with you that bubbly appearance, ganglioma, DNAT, um, that's how how it looks like. Then the PET scan showed that the the um, the hypometabolism is rather even larger. It went way beyond or way past that one uh, one lesion. And as we all know, almost all ganglioglioma's and DNAT are surrounded and can be surrounded by um, by cortical dysplastic cells. So this is not an uncommon thing that you'll see the, the, um, the hypometabolism on the PET scan to really expand way beyond or way past that lesion that you, that you see, um, especially in ganglioglioma and, and DNAT, because um, they, they actually some literature suggests that uh, up to 100% of those tumors will be surrounded with, uh, with cortical dysplasia, uh, typically type, uh, uh, type 2B. Um, and this is where really it takes us to the next layer, the next level, the importance of um, invasive monitoring or electrocardiography. Um, so in this case, probably I will 100% do exactly what you did. Um, this does not need to be at two stages. So this does not need to be uh, like stereotactic, then come back or uh, implant the patient, leave them with the electrodes for a few days. This can easily be a one, one step or one phase um, um, from, a, from a recording standpoint. I'm still very interested in Dr. Kaufman's input from a surgical standpoint. Um, but this is, to Dr. Kaufman's earlier point, to be able to better resect um, all the epileptic tissue, not just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so the lesion is easy, well, not easy, but the lesion is clear to see and um, approaching as long as it's in a resectable area. Uh, but what about what's happening around the lesion? Um, uh, how much epileptic tissue are we leaving? And, um, and I can tell from the post-resection um, post MRI, you guys did a really beautiful job um, resecting that temporal lobe, even beyond that lesion, assuming that there was some electrical activity, electrocorticography activity on the, on the rest of the temporal lobe um, to, to justify that, that big resection, hence the, um, uh, the, the seed of freedom. One last comment, and I know you mentioned this has been about a year and the patient's still taking the seed of medication. And this is, uh, there are a lot of opinions in the literature. When do you wean? seizure medications in patients um, after epilepsy surgery. Um, so there are a number of different um, literature with a number of different studies. I'm gonna quote the, the one from Baylor College of Medicine, which is where I, I, I belong to or I trained. Um, you typically reduce, uh, or what I do is I reduce the seizure medications um, if the patient uh, is seizure free uh, right after the surgery, number one. Number two, I didn't see any um, spikes or interictal spikes on my electrocorticography at the end of the resection in the surgery. That's what I will reduce at least by one medicine. The patient will leave the hospital on two, not the three medications. Six months later, that's when I repeat another EEG. If I no longer see any interictal activity, 
That's when I start weaning the second medicine. By the end of the first year to 18 months, if I'm angle one by then, um, and my EEG continues to not show any intraocular activity, that's when I will wean the third medicine. That's 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 kind of the the um, Richard Rockavi and Eli Mizrahi's approach to to weaning, and that's exactly how I uh, I personally do it. So, Dr. Kaufman, I'm I'm interested in your in your um, input as far as the um, the approach, the the surgical approach um, for such a, for such a tumor. What what parts would you be looking at resecting and, and um, how would that ECOG help guide that? Right. So, so there's a whole lot of nuance in situations where you have a clear, possibly neoplastic lesion. And one of the things to keep in mind is on the neurology epilepsy side, these lesions come to your attention because they're causing seizures. However, I see lesions, DNETs, low grade gliomas all the time that are not causing seizures. And that does not mean that they require surgery. I, most of them can actually be very safely and appropriately watched with time. So it's a subset, and though, although it is not uncommon for them to cause seizures, it is still a subset of these that cause seizures. So then it brings us into the next issue, which you, you addressed is these, particularly DNETs and gangliomas, please sorry, um, recognize that the area around there may be full of cortical dysplasia. It may not be. Um, getting back to the do no harm, while well, you can do a, say, well, we're going to do an aggressive resection because we assume there is, that's not always the right answer. And, and the right answer isn't clear. For any given patient, um, it's going to be hard to say how much of that tissue around that lesion is really additionally epileptogenic. And it also is affected by the patient's age. Younger patients are a bit more likely to have a kindling effect that a chronic lesion is now causing independent generators in the tissue nearby. Whereas older patients who um, develop seizures secondary to a neoplastic lesion are far more likely to have that secondarily generated only by irritation of the lesion and therefore doing a simple lesionectomy is perfectly appropriate. Um, so it's it's not a given in any in any given patient. You have to handle on a case by case basis. Um, recognizing the yes, absolutely, there may be independent seizure generators next to the lesion, but it's not universally the case. While repeat surgery comes with its own challenges, can be quite significant based on prior scar tissue. At the same time, and sort of common uh, understanding in surgery is. As we often say, surgery is a bit like salt. You can't unsalt your food. Once you have done it, there's no undoing it, meaning you can always add more, but you can't undo what's been done. So those are principles that we always have to go by when we assess any patient, um, this in a, particularly in a lesional situation, where we're trying to identify how much surgery they need, trying to find that that you know, ideal middle ground between too much and not enough. Uh, can I do a small comment, uh, please? Uh, regarding this case, uh, uh, actually uh, we received him uh, and we were lucky to do the whole pre-surgical workup within a uh, few weeks only to do the uh, pre-surgical workup and the surgery immediately, and we considered him, as you know, uh, refractory seizures, they have to be on two medications, and this patient was only on Kipra, and he was around 30, 40 per kilo. So uh, with this uh, history, frequent seizure, uh, uh, things moved forward uh, in order to do the surgery as soon as possible for him. And his cognitive function was great. He continued to do excellent at school. Uh, we just saw him in the clinic. He's the first in his class. So Dr. Ayla, thank you for that comment. I think this is, um, again, as, as you yourself being um, an amazing epileptologist and a, and a, great, um, a great physician, um, I 100% agree. And this is a, a, a really very important point that you bring up. 
um, because we've always practiced drug risk and epilepsy is failure of two or more properly chosen, properly dosed, well-tolerated medications, the definition that we all know from the ILAE. But you bring a, a phenomenal point here because in this patient, we know that this lesion is not going to go away. So, and it, it was causing trouble. It was causing seizures. Um, so despite that patient being only in one medicine, uh, I, I, I think this is absolutely the right approach that that you and your center did, um, rather than just waiting for the inevitable, uh, there's no reason to wait. And as we all know from Anberg's work and from uh, Michael Macon's work and all of those people, the longer I wait on seizures, the more I'm gonna have trouble. So the earlier intervention, especially in lesional epilepsy like this, um, I think this is, um, uh, th th that's a great point. Thank you for bringing it up. I think this is, this is absolutely um, what we all should practice. Um, if it's a lesional epilepsy, if it's that high burden of a seizure, um, I agree with you. Uh, adding a second medicine or waiting for it to meet that definition by two or three medications, it's just going to be wasting time. So um, that's a good point. Okay. I'd like to begin further, you know, add and second uh, all that's been said. Um, yes, we absolutely know that uh, lesional epilepsy, in particular, we're talking about neoplastic related epilepsy, just simply uh, does not respond well to, to medical treatment. Uh, and there's no question in the surgical world that someone has a neoplastic lesion that's causing them harm and harm certainly included by an uncontrolled epilepsy um, and even a controlled epilepsy frankly if someone clearly has uh, regular seizure activities being caused by a focal neoplastic lesion or a focal vascular lesion uh, most surgeons will tell you that in the balance of the long-term care for that patient that is a curable epilepsy more likely than not um, with a, a relatively low risk surgery. So again, absolutely agree that patient does not require or, or should not and actually at all and have to wait uh, for over a year for their surgical treatment. Um, and, and anything that is clearly that focally lesional, um, uh, and I'm essentially largely excluding uh, kind of a more diffuse cortical dysplasia, but a, a focal neoplastic or vasculation should not have to wait um, for surgical assessment treatment. The other thing I wanted to add um, that, you, that was mentioned here is how much that counts in surgery, and that is how it comes from uh, so Oftentimes, the just will say, um, is that yes, immediately after surgery, even before you've had two weeks to determine if the any effect of the surgery, the parents and families will say, yes, I have a new child. They are more responsive. They're able to focus better. They're now actually more appropriately emotional. Um, their, their speech is better. Um, you see these immediate improvements very commonly um, in patients who have undergone a successful uh, surgical resection. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now we can move to the um, last case, and but not the least, um, and to be presented by Dr. Uh, Ahmad Taha. He's assistant consultant pediatric neurology uh, from Ain Shams University. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so uh, I'm Ahmad Fahan Khayri. I'm um, assistant pediatric neurologist at Inchance University. And today I'll be presenting a case of temporal lobe epilepsy, one of the um, epilepsy cases that we did surgery on. She's a pediatric patient. She is a five and a half year old child with, um, with no hand predominance and a healthy uh, product of a non consanguineous marriage with a negative family history of epilepsy or any other neurological disorder. Her developmental history is remarkable for cognitive and speech delay. She received her vaccinations in time with no vaccination-related seizures. Um, and her neurological examination is unremarkable, apart from autistic features, hyperactivity, poor attention span, and intellectual disability. Sorry to interrupt. Oh. Can you use presentation mode, please? OK. Is it clear now? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. 
So regarding her uh, seizure semiology, she has one seizure type, which is a non-febrile um, focal unaware seizure. Um, and the seizure that started at one year of age. Uh, I'll be explaining the seizure semiology more in the video, but it starts with the right upper limb and lower limb tonic posturing that is followed by um, a bad living behavior. Then the patient develops automatism by manual and oral, which is also followed by post to left eye rubbing. There's no history of state epilepticus. There's no history of um, secondary generalization. There's no febrile seizures. The seizures were nocturnal and undiurnal, but more nocturnal. The seizure frequency was one to three per day. Um, she was on Brevirzitam, Octocarb, Clonazepam, and Lamotrigine. And this is the seizure. Uh, we recorded um, more than 20 seizures in five days. So uh, her seizure starts out of sleep. She wakes up and is um, followed by um, a rise upper limb and lower limb tonic extension. All her seizures were stereotypical. Then she would be followed by bed leaving behavior. And then you can appreciate the uh, the oral and the, um, the bimanual automatism. And then there is left eye rubbing. So based on the semiology, um, how would you localize and lateralize the seizure? Left temporal, left extra temporal, right temporal, right extra temporal, or undetermined. Okay. So as uh, more than 58% 58% of you have answered, the uh, the answer is left temporal. Okay. So we will um, proceed. So the interictal EEG, um, it showed, as you can see, this is a referential montage, a common average montage. Um, there is always a right frontal sharp discharges that are apparent in the FP2 and the FPO4 to bilateral synchrony. And regarding her ictor EEG onset, it always showed this generalized onset of a bilateral uh, voltage attenuation that is followed by low amplitude fast activities that builds up into a higher amplitude with no um, lateralization that can be appreciated. So the next question is such a bilateral scalp EEG onset, a red flag against uh, a focal seizure onset, yes or no? Okay, so 68% uh, answered no. Okay. So we proceeded with the um, new imaging. We started with the uh, we started with the one and a half Tesla, and then we proceeded to the three Tesla. So this is the three Tesla MRI eclipse protocol. Uh, it showed um, it showed uh, this is the two T two sequence showing the left um, hippocampal um, um, left hippocampal and. Uh, uh, swelling as well as there's also cortical thickening of the left interrhinal and the parahippocampal gyri. And the PET is also showing hypermetabolism of the left mesial temporal and the temporal pole. Okay, so the third question is intellectual impairment, comorbid autistic features, a contraindication for epilepsy surgery, yes or no? Okay, so most of you have answered no. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so um, if you review our hypothesis, so according to semiology, based on the semiology, we can lateralize the, the, the seizure onset to the, uh, to the left side. Uh, incorrectly, it was um, um, more on the right. Uh, ictly, it was more bilateral. But the neuroimaging, whether the MRI and the PET was um, on, the, on the left side. So we proceeded with the, uh, with the surgery. We did a left anterior temporal lobectomy with an amygdala uh, hippocampectomy that we, was ECOG guided on February 20, uh, 23. The histopathology showed FCDT type 2B. Um, and this is the ECOG uh, preoperative showing spikes. Okay. And although the the discharge frequency dis, uh, de decreased uh, post-operatively, but there were still um, uh, discharges apparent, as you can see. So the fourth question, what ECOG feature is the most localizing? Is there a focal spike in the middle of the grid, a high frequency oscillation, or a rhythmic delta activity? Because it's 57% answered as a focal spike in the middle of the grid. Okay. So um, her outcome is Ingle 1A. She's free since she did the surgery four months ago. She is currently on reverse ethanol lamotrigine oxfarb. Her parents supported better attention, cognition, and behavior. And this is the post surgical uh, um, CT, as you can see. So uh, thank you, and I would like to leave you to uh, uh, our experts' uh, opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taha. Uh, Dr. Abdul Maat, if you can just give us some uh, discussion about the semiology and the, uh, your input in the case. So this is a very interesting semiology, actually, because um, if we look at the case of someone as, um, as having this patient in clinic, so the seizures happen nocturnally, they happen at a very high frequency, so having multiple every night, and the seizures are very brief, so lasting for a few seconds. And um, it starts with this asymmetric um, tonic slash dystonic extension, and I totally agree with Dr. Ahmed Taha uh, that it's it's more on the right side. You see that more extension on the on the right side, but it happens bilaterally. But yes, 100%, it's more on the on the on that right side. So. Uh, right off the bat, the semiology is might make someone more think of a frontal lobe seizure. Um, it's brief. It's in sleep. It's um, it's mainly slash mostly motor. You don't see any uh, head deviation. And uh, later, she's actually rubbing her her eye, which can be a localizing um, uh, an ipsilateral localizing sign or lateralizing sign, I should, I should say. So the, the the picture is not is not a slam dunk uh, like some of the some of the the Semiology we saw before, uh, the adversive head deviation, the means of temporal uh, lobe aplasia, or even the neocortical um, temporal lobe seizures that typically would present even differently. But we also got to remember the temporal lobe is still very much connected to the frontal and the occipital lobe. Sometimes we'll have temporal lobe seizures presenting with vomiting, and we might think, okay, this is an occipital lobe seizure. Um, sometimes we'll see temporal lobe seizures presenting with very much frontal lobe uh, like semiology because of that very rapid spread zone. So Dr. Ahmed, if you please fast forward to the, um, to the EEG, and I think this, this kind of highlights it, that um, she has that very rather rapid spread that on her ictal EEG. Look at that. So she does, even if she's having a little bit of a lead on, on one side, that rather electrodecremal response, that high, uh, that, that, that um, uh, moderate voltage beta activity, it kind of suggests that very rapid spread. And um, it becomes more of a spread zone rather than the ictal zone, what we're seeing in the, in the semiology. And again, back to the points I think everybody made, Dr. Raida made, um, Dr. Nermeen made, Dr. Kaufman and I made the concordance of the data. I cannot take only the semiology and decide on it. I cannot take only the EG and decide on it. Then the MRI became, made things more clear. Now the MRI is telling me very clearly, I do have a left temporal lobe um, T2 hyperintensity. I do see that hippocampal uh, edema, hippocampal swelling. I do see that 
uh, gray white matter differentiation um, that's being smudged. All of that is, is very nicely putting me there. Um, but remember, I still have something that I do have a question mark on my frontal lobe, given that, given that semiology. Then comes the next layer, my functional studies. What, what, where can I better localize it? And, uh, and now I'm looking very nicely on the, on the temporal lobe. Um, and I really, um, I, again, Dr. Kaufman and I worked a ton together. And, and this is, this is what, what we'll, we'll, we'll try to, to approach to his earlier point do no harm. Um, how much are, what's our confidence rate that we're actually targeting um, the, the epileptic tissue? So next layer comes that electrocorticography and the electrocorticography is absolutely crucial here, especially that I have the semiology with a little bit of question mark on it. Yes, it is, it is left hemispheric. So that's reassuring the, M the MRI is helping me on the left temporal lobe. The um, PET is helping me, but I wanna, I wanna get that further confirmation to know how far do I need to extend um, beyond that, uh, uh, what I see as a maybe tip of the iceberg. So, um, so this is, okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry yes. about that. Um, th then comes the electrocography and what do I rely on? So um, all what Dr. Um, Ahmed showed um, as far as the spikes, as far as the, um, the high frequency oscillation, as far as the delta, all of those are very important signs. If I were to pick one, it's certainly the high voltage spike activity um, in, the, in the middle of the grid. And this is a very important thing that we all uh, should keep in mind. When I'm seeing spikes, remember, I'm very now narrowed down on, the, on that epileptic tissue. I am not doing a scalp EG anymore. So if I am not um, well centered on top of the ectal um, uh, area, I can see spikes on my grid that can be simply spread from a, from a nearby zone. So it has to be nicely centered in my grid or nicely centered in my activity, or I can sometimes, um, or the, the surgeon will can sometimes put a depth electrode to ensure that we're really seeing it in a three dimension. It's not just these spikes. And so as you can see on this, on this um, uh, nice spread, you do see it nicely in the middle of your, um, of your uh, two strips here. So I know from the electrocardiography that I'm right on top of that lesion, right on top of the epileptic tissue, not the spread zone. Um, and after the resection, you expect to see at least significant improvement. You occasionally will see that post-resection spikes. The morphology will look different, um, but those are gonna be much less frequent, are gonna be very much scattered all over. And it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be as, um, as cumbersome. And it's not a prognostic factor for, for later on outcome. So um, this was a really great case um, presenting a different semiology. Every case we talked about today was um, where it was a, a temporal lobe seizure, but they can present very differently. The EG can be very nicely precise, like the first case, or can be spread between two hemispheres, like um, the case Dr. Wajd um, presented and this case as well. Um, then looking at the multiple other uh, concordant uh, data to, to realize inside what, what to do. So this is a case where this kid had been on medication, multiple medications. So back to my earlier point about when do you wean medicines? And I think this is, uh, I will say the same thing. Um, uh, if I see a nice electrocardiography stopping a medicine by the, by the time of discharge, weaning the, the second one six months later, if no uh, interactive activity, a year later after that, a year to 18 months, that's when you completely take off, off medicine, then, um, then you're uh, pretty much done. So. Dr. Kaufman, um, what 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 did I miss? What do you want to add? Um, I, I, I think you covered everything very nicely, but a couple of things that we haven't covered today. Um, we say, yep, someone would be a good candidate for steroid EEG. They have temporal lobe epilepsy, but we haven't actually discussed how do you actually sample a temporal lobe effectively and sort of make sure you've uh, identified where it's coming from um, and where it's coming from. And so it's important to have um, a, a paradigm, um, such an algorithm for where you want to sample for, for any given lesion, particularly for your classic temporal epilepsies. So you clearly want to be able to sample anterior hippocampus, posterior hippocampus, amygdala. You want to be able to get some neocortical temporal activity um, but on top of all this, then you know, essentially your semiology is going to also speak to where else you want to check for a spread pattern. Having some frontal electrodes are useful. Insular electrodes can be useful, understanding there are some additional risks, sur surgical challenges for 
uh, insular electrodes, but it's important to have a, a basic paradigm that you use for most patients so that you can reliably say, yes, we've kind of checked all of our bases as far as you know where it's spreading to. We, we can confidently say that this we are not seeing independent generators or something that's being suppressed by the primary generator. Um, so, so having that kind of general plan that you go to for any given temporal epilepsy is important. The other thing that, that's worth mentioning is, is intraoperative uh, electrocorticography. Um, once you start resecting tissue, you start getting some strange geometries that are hard to sample. Uh, and until someone can create a three-dimensional space occupying electrode, which I would, if anyone can, please let us know, that would be fantastic. But with that limitation, um, there's a significant sampling uh, bias that occurs at that point in time. You can have resected tissue that's clearly epileptogenic, but now you're left to sampling what's left. And there's no perfect way to sample those cut margins the way you would want to. And so it's important to figure out, you know, have we appropriately sampled the remaining geometry that's there of the, of the brain tissue? And then how do you assess what you see in that tissue? And you, you, you touched on that briefly, but you're going to often see irritated brain. You're gonna see brain that may be throwing a spike here or there and you can chase that. Um, but then again, a lot of that's just irritated brain. So, so having a sense of what is legitimately problematic or concerning um, and what is probably just the irritated brain is important to be able to understand and differentiate. And then of course, how far can you go? There's going to be what we call safe limits of resection wherein we don't wanna cause someone a, a neurologic deficit by sort of pushing boundaries on unclear ECOG data. So those are all important considerations um, for any given case, um, uh, surgically speaking. Thank you very much uh, for all uh, the presenter and the panelists uh, for the interesting cases. Um, so I will ask the our uh, participant to uh, put down their uh, questions in the Q and A uh, button, um, and I will um, first. Uh, so there is one question regarding the first case. Um, uh, so what is next if there's another site of seizure other than the temporal location? So remember the first case was, uh, there was temporal uh, uh, lesion plus there was uh, the frontal lesion. So I'm happy to take that and um, Dr. Kaufman, please feel free to, to, to add or, or edit what I'm saying. So um, if it's more than one lesion, if it's more than one focus, uh, the first question is we got to answer is, um, are both foci seizure inducing? Um, am I getting all the problems or all the seizures out of one focus? In which case, that's the focus that I go after. That's the focus that we that we try to resect. And um, if we confirm that the other focus is not causing seizures, and we talked about how we confirm that by the functional studies, by the electrocardiography, and so on and so forth. So we don't do anything about the other lesion. Sometimes we have both lesions are causing problems. Um, and most in the, those cases, that's when we either will not go forward with, uh, with epilepsy res surgery resection. Uh, if you have multiple foci, um, we might not. And again, I think um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is a good example where you can have multiple foci. Uh, in that case, we're probably not, not probably, we will not be going after it surgically. The third, the third scenario, um, and I think tuberous sclerosis is a good example for that, where you might have multiple tubers, and, but you have one of them um, or two very close to each other that are causing like 80, 90% of the seizures. And that would be a palliative approach. So understanding, and this is a very important discussion that has to happen with the family, that um, it, the team, this is the epileptologist, the neurosurgeon would sit down and explain to the family what's the expected outcome, that the patient might not be completely seizure-free because we will be leaving some other tubers uh, that can cause seizures, but it's a palliative. Um, we are aiming to reduce seizures by 70% or 80% if we can confirm, and this typically happens by, electric, by, by uh, either stereotactic EG or implanting the patient to confirm the, the origin of, of all those seizures. So if it's not causing problems, don't, don't do anything about it. Remove the lesion that's causing problems. Um, if, um, if multiple lesions causing problems, this is not a resection candidate. You can think of other non-pharmacological options. Um, again, then the tuberous sclerosis where you have multiple lesions, but one of them is causing the majority of the problem. In some cases, yes, that can be palliative resection. 
Thank you. And uh, so we have seen few cases of which were presented. They had bilateral intraplatiform discharges. So one of the questions has been asked, is it, this is related, does it point to one focus or two foci of um, seizures? So again, you're going to have multiple uh, interictal activity for one of the following reasons. Either you have more than one focus, and the morphology in this case will be different on the EG. Um, if my patient is having only one seizure type and I have bilateral um, discharges and uh, the morphology is similar, especially in mesial um, epilepsy or medial structural epilepsy, um, then this is where the um, invasive monitoring can help um, can help in addition to the functional studies, making sure that I, I am not um, dealing with multiple structural um, epilepsy. It can still be one focus that can be spreading into bilateral areas independently, not necessarily at the same time. Thank you. And a question for Professor Kaufman. So what should be the extent of excision and tumor associated uh, temporal lobe epilepsy? So when to include hippocampus and when to preserve it? It is going to be very important. It is suggesting that there is any directly deeper mesial temporal activity going on. If there's a if there's a semiology that suggests that it's more mesial, then that should be investigated. To use electrocorticography to further um, more earlier theory to further delineate what may or may not be problematic. Um, if, however, please see me not. Extend much beyond um, actual lesional resection itself. Not sure if I heard clearly the answer. Uh, I'll try again. Um, the, it, it's going to depend on what. The sound is getting interrupted, the Professor Kaplan. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, uh, Professor Kaufman? Looks like he might be having some technical yeah. sound. So I think what I heard what I heard him um, say is. Um, it depends on the location. If it's extend, if the tumor is extending mesially, um, and and uh, there's some imaging um, showing potential mesial inclusion, that's when that's when um, um, he. Uh, that's again what I what I could make from the cutting in and out um, that he would include that. If it's something where the electrocorticography or the stereotactic EEG shows that the hippocampus or the mesial structures are not um, an epileptogenic focus and there are no uh, activity. Um, coming out of that area, uh, that's when he would preserve the, the hippocampus. Thank you very much. Uh, I, would, I would just like to uh, please um, comment on this uh, section. Um, when you have um, a lesion, a temporal lesion in the dominant hemisphere, then the resection has to be, is, uh, is limited by the, because it's dominant, but still um, uh, do we use the intraoperative ECOG? Although we cannot exceed a certain limitation posterior. So I'll tell you the from yeah. the neurophysiologist standpoint, but I'll, I'll, I, Dr. Kaufman, can you can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Just because of lesions on the language center dominant side does not uh, in any way uh, suggest you should use electrocorticography. The, the surgeon knows his anatomy, the surgeon knows the, the physical limitations of, of how far something can go, whether it's dominant or non-dominant, but you really should be still identifying 
uh, intraoperatively what seems to be an uh, active uh, as, as, an, as a secondary side. We, we understand that part of the reason why epilepsy surgery is successful and it works is because once you have a foci generating problems, it's no longer healthy. It's no longer doing something beneficial. It's not turning itself on and then being problematic and then turning off and doing a useful function. So when you find ab clearly focally abnormal tissue, it's essentially always safe to remove. The question is always, how close are you to functional tissue that may be problematic to remove? But when you have a very, very clear, you know, constantly discharging piece of brain tissue, that is not a piece of tissue that is also functionally doing something useful. So we know our anatomy, we know how far we can safely go, but that corticography really is that fine tuning that's really gonna be able to do let you walk out to the appropriate line and, and find that, that appropriate middle ground where you're not causing harm, but you are maximizing someone's outcome. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree with Dr. Kaufman. Actually, him and I, we have numerous patients that, um, um, that we ended up resecting their, um, their lesion or their epileptic tissue on the dominant hemisphere, some of which actually were uh, even on the, on the hemisphere. So that, um, but it, it, it to, to that point, also to to provide the prognosis, or at least to know what to expect post surgery, having that electrocardiography will be absolutely crucial. Um, and even if we leave the surgery, um, once the surgeon Lee reaches that limit of okay, cannot resect anymore because of aliquot cortex, or, or or worry about affecting function, even if we leave behind some abnormal electrocardiography um, uh, discharges. That in itself still, I, there's a pretty good chance, um, depending on how much epileptic tissue was removed, to by itself not leave enough networking to mount more seizures uh, or significantly reduce seizures. So um, it, it, being on a dominant hemisphere is never a contraindication to A, move forward with surgery, and B, certainly do electrocardiography to push that to that, to that limit to make sure that you're getting as much of the epileptic tissue as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for and thank you. So there is a, uh, another question uh, regarding case three. Uh, so uh, the question is um, that this, the patient uh, presented uh, had one or two seizures in his life, and um, he's controlled in and if he's controlled in anti seizure medication. So would you go for uh, surgery for uh, lesion and uh, temporal uh, lesions? Um, most certainly. So I think that's. Yeah. Go, go ahead, go please. Yeah, um, from a surgical standpoint, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's, you, you look, you see, you're at a situation where you can potentially cure someone. Um, medication is not curative, uh, period. Um, you're talking about someone that's been spent their entire life on medication. The cost, the lifetime is the economic cost is significant, but there's, there will always be a risk that someone missed their medication or something happened um, and they start having seizures again. And, and so that, that when you can take that off the board, when you can eliminate that risk for someone, when you have a purely lesional um, uh, entity, and again, things like vascular lesions, like cavernous malformations are a great example. Um, they're otherwise relatively low risk, but we know they, they don't reoccur, they don't propagate. Um, and it's not that you have some hiding somewhere else that you can't see, generally speaking. You can absolutely remove that lesion and cure someone of their epilepsy, which is going to be a better long-term outcome for them than a lifetime on seizure medication. And Professor Kaufman, so if you are going for surgical resection, so do you add any um, anti-seizure medication like phenytoin, uh, peri surgical period or post-surgical period? So um, as far as immediate post-resection, uh, the data is not very clear in that. And even I, admittedly in, in our own practice, Dr. Athamoy and I, um, I will admit that it has not been a universal phenomenon that we say, yes, this patient has you know, immediately received uh, phosphonatoin uh, perioperatively or postoperatively. But I can tell you anecdotally, we certainly have not seen um, any difference in the immediate uh, appearance of postoperative seizures. Um, with which we largely discount should they occur as far as being predictive of long-term outcome. But 
Well, it's a great question. It's a sort of an unanswered question, uh, but I can tell you, at least anecdotally, that there doesn't seem to make a significant difference, both in the, the short-term and the long-term seizure outcome. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Abdul Mati, so is, is, are there any um, technical tips for ECO just to increase its sensitivity? Yeah, so I think Dr. Kaufman alluded to that. So um, we got to make sure that we have our um, nomenclatures. We got to make sure that we're having our proper coverage. So there are um, rather universally known approaches to coverage of the um, a temporal lobe resection or a frontal lobe resection or a mesial resection and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the important thing is it making sure that I am actually having proper implantation of my electrodes. And this is a super, super important thing. And this is where the team really gets together, the nurse surgeon and the epileptologist um, to map that. Um, there are some agreed upon maps. How do I cover my um, my uh, my temporal convexity or how, well, where do I implant my um, depth electrodes for my temporal lobe? Um, but the important thing is I got to make sure that I am, I am doing that three-dimensional approach to my lesion or to my ectal, uh, to my epileptogenic zone. Um, I'm happy to share um, very briefly here a um, couple of slides that kind of highlights some of the some of the implantation uh, um, coverage. It's not going to be comprehensive for every possible uh, implantation, but it will give a little bit of an idea where do we where do we implant and how do we implant and so forth. So let me share my screen here very quickly. Um, So while you are putting up your slide, I might ask Professor Kaufman. So is there any role for thermal coagulation in temporal lobe epilepsy? That's a great question. Um, and that's gonna, as is often the case, it's gonna depend on a lot of factors. If we're talking about just a, a general temporal lobe epilepsy, particularly in the pediatric population, um, so far now that you know, as, a, as a kind of worldwide community, we've been doing this for a little over 10 years. The, the outcomes, um, the ankle outcomes are not particularly good. So you're, you're dropping your ankle outcome closer to about a 40, um, 40 to 45% ankle class one outcome to do that uh, in the pediatric population, which when we know we can get a much better uh, outcome with open resection, it's hard to make that argument. That being said, if you have it available at an institution, that's something that would fall under, say, informed consent, meaning families ought to know that that may be an option, but they would also need to know that the, the lower success rates. Getting back, however, to uh, the comments made that Dr. Abdelway made about tuberous sclerosis, those are patients actually that may uh, benefit from a multiple uh, thermal ablation approach. If you actually have multiple tubers, that appear to be uh, foci, independent foci. Um, there's been some great work done out there uh, at several institutions, Texas Children's uh, University of Syracuse, where they have been able to do multiple thermal ablation targets and get very good, very successful outcomes. On the adult side, when you have a pure mesial temporal sclerosis, those patients do seem to do much better, um, but that's likely because that is a essentially it's a different type of pathology fundamentally than what you see in the pediatric world. There's much more neocortical activity occurring in the pediatric world. So that's likely uh, the reason for the poor success rate in children is that yes, you can burn out, very successfully burn out the amygdala, burn out the hippocampus, but the neocortical activity remains. Um, and so it, it tends to be a less favorable option, particularly in kind of your standard temporal lobe epilepsies. Um, than just a, a basic open resection. Thank you. You can. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, like I mentioned, th those are going to be very quick. A um, uh, couple of pictures here. So, uh, I'm going to only cover the electrocardiography. I will not cover the stereotactic, as stereotactic can take quite a bit of time to go over the entry point and exit point and so forth. Um, but this is for that for the convexity. The, the point I'm trying to make from those slides is that you want to cover as much as possible. Um, of the area that you're that you're you, that you're trying to to record for. So if it's a small cortical dysplasia, I don't need my eight by eight grids. All what I might need is like four by five. That might be all enough. 
If it's a NAND lesion, that's what I need a little, a rather larger um, coverage. Um, sometimes it can be by multiple strips, again, depending on what's available. And the reason I, I brought those two pictures, because I understand completely that um, different regions and different centers might have access to different uh, or to, to less or more resources. Um, it also can be, this is for the mesial. Um, you, you always want to make sure that I have that, my, um, my depth electrode in addition to um, coverage of that mesial, uh, mesial structure. Um, most of the time, those are what I'm showing you some of the standard. Uh, there are also some custom protocols or custom uh, placement depending on the case. Um, this is the very typical lateral uh, temporal that you see here with some depth electrodes that will go into the hippocampus, making sure that um, to the earlier question that hippocampus is covered, um, some of the mesial as well as the lateral. So depending on the area, you wanna get as much coverage as possible. Um, if it's lesional, you can use a smaller uh, grid. If it's non-lesional, that's when you wanna cover more areas, especially if it's if it's the semiology is not very clear. Um, as Dr. Kaufman mentioned, as we talked, sometimes we'll even put in a temporal lobe um, seizure, we, we might um, ask Dr. Kaufman, our surgeon, to slip in one or two strips in the frontal lobe just to make sure that we have we have good coverage there. So um, those are some of the basic um, uh, standard protocols. But again, every patient will require their own custom protocol based on the on the concordance of the data that we learn from their PET, their SPEC, the MRI, and so forth. Thank you very much. And, and Dr. Abdelmati, so what's your experience um, in a novel AED like AMPA receptor blocker uh, in controlling um, uh, seizures for those patients with lesional, uh, 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 lesional, uh, uh, this one, abnormality in the MRI just before having the surgery? So um, this is actually, there's very little data on, on, on the benefit of doing that. So we haven't done it. We, we're not, um, we typically will go forward with the, with the surgery, with the resection. Um, there are some drawbacks um, that's again been published um, on an easy um, uh, um, interceptor. So we haven't done it. We haven't been doing it, but what, what um, we try to expedite the process as much as we can. So waiting to pre-treat before the surgery is something that we, we have not been doing in our center. Okay, and one question uh, regarding like, um, I think maybe we can have it as a general statement. So the, um, the seizures or the, the seizures, the clinical semiology, uh, EEG and the MRI are not uh, concordant. So how, you, how is your approach? Uh, so one of the questions they were asking regarding case three the lesions were on the left and uh, the semiology was not from the left. Yeah, so um, sometimes we need a tiebreaker um, and that can be functional studies like, uh, like in that case three, like some of the PET scans or um, SPEC. Um, other times we might need um, invasive monitoring, um, invasive monitoring as in stereotactic EG and or electrocardiography. Whenever there is lack of concordance of the data between clinical EEG and MRI, we got to really go back and relook very carefully at the EG. Sometimes the EG will tell us the full story um, that we didn't get the first time. Um, and what I mean by that, looking at the at the bilateral interictal activity, answering the question: Are they really independent interictal, or are they potentially coming from the same focus? And we talked about how can we differentiate the, the two. Um, when the MRI and the EEG are in concord in concordance but the clinical semiology is not in concordance, I look and see if it's mesial, that's not uncommon. Remember, we see the clinical features um, after, after the, the um, involved cortical tissue um, gets involved. So if it's something mesial that will take its time to spread laterally, to start showing me in the contralateral side motor activity, that, that can explain it to me. So that, that lack of concordance can be explained by looking at the location of the, of the ability. If I still am not concordant and I still am having um, lack of lateralization, I before thinking of applied surgery, I have to lateralize. I have to know right or left. Then I can think of what's my next step. Is it going to be functional studies? Um, a lot of times um, will be um, invasive monitoring. And again, invasive monitoring is diagnostic. I don't necessarily need to come out of every invasive monitoring with a resection. A lot of times invasive monitoring will lead to knowing that, nope, this patient is not a resective candidate. This can simply be a BNS or a ketogenic diet or something else. Um, so I, again, this is the algorithm that, um, that uh, I think through. Is it 
if I have two, but not the third concordant, I got to look at the structural reason why it's not concordant. Do I need other studies? And always we can rely on stereotactic EG to help to make that make the difference. Dr. Kaufman, would you would you approach it differently? No, no, no difference there, but there is there is a degree in regards to discordance, right? right? Something can be slightly discordant. I mean, this seems more anterior temporal and this seems more posterior temporal. When you have strongly discordant data, that's an absolute kind of red flag to kind of tap the brakes on and doing something particularly aggressive. I fully agree. Yes, you need you know, more tiebreakers, but when you really have like a very strong discordance, like if you say, yes, this is a, this is a patient who has a posterior left temporal uh, foci or seeming, seeming so, but there's a, a right frontal lesion on MRI, that, that's a, you know, that's a, a strong concern that, that this really, this picture doesn't fit. Keeping in mind that the piece that matters most is still that EEG. Uh, you know, it sounds silly and obvious to say you can't see seizures and MRI, but it's an important point that to some extent, the MRI doesn't matter. You really want to see a lesion. You would love to see a lesion where the EEG says there should be one, but sometimes you don't. Um, and if you see a lesion somewhere else, it can be purely incidental. If someone has an arachnoid cyst on the other side, well, one to 3% of the human population have arachnoid cysts. That's just a non-issue. Um, so, so, you know, it, it does come back to the EEG. And so if you, if you have an EEG that's really screaming at you, this is focal, this is focal, and the MRI doesn't match, that largely would disregard the MRI. If you get, get other studies, get a spec, get a PET. If you don't have it available, then and you can safely do a stereo EEG, you can do that. As Dr. Adam already said, not every stereo EEG is going to come back as this is a resectable candidate, uh, but it does answer the question. You know, it does give a patient or a family some sense of closure that, yes, this was this is not something that's going to be amenable, safe, or Perhaps it's amenable to alternate means. So as we mentioned, VNS, RNS, some other some, some other sort of you know uh, intervention. But you, know, you answer the question, so to speak, is that yes? You know, is there something that can, that can be done about this in, in a, in a you know, surgical fashion? Thank you. And Professor Kaufman, so uh, there is one question: um, If there is hippocampus with inflammation and sclerosis, so how do you know that if this is amenable to resection? Not clear about the nature of the question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Inflam so they are the the uh, participants asking if there is inflammation and sclerosis. So um, I'm not sure what does he mean by inflammation. Yeah, th those are those are characteristics that only a pathologist can tell you once you cut it out. Um, an MRI can show T2 signal change, but you you're taking a step further to say yes, this is sclerosis versus yes, this is inflammation. That can't be determined preoperatively um, or even intraoperatively. And um, I think maybe this will be the last question. So, um, do you use keto diet for patients uh, for those who are surgical candidates? So, before pursuing to surgery? No. So, if, um, if the patient is a surgical candidate, um, this is the only so far um, I'm going to have to exclude. Uh, the seven other curable epilepsies, which are all metabolic. This is the only cure that we have for drug resistant epilepsy. Anything else will be palliative treatment. If we're talking about neuromodulation, if we're talking about ketogenic diet, if we're talking about any of the medication, it is not meant to be a cure. Um, so if the patient is a surgical candidate, um, that should be the answer. Candidate means it is um, localized, it's lateralizing, it is localizable, it is not over aliquin cortex, <coughs> excuse me, but proven by, by functional studies. And obviously the patient um, uh, um, is agreeable to it. And I have the technical capacity and the skills to be able to do it. If I have all of the above in place, then surgery should and must be the answer, nothing else. Um, because if I do ketogenic diet, if I do anything else, non-pharmacological other than surgery, I'm only delaying the inevitable. But the problem is if I come back to that same patient two, three years down the road, uh, what was resectable back then might no longer be resectable. Uh, as we all know from epilepsy networking, um, that patient might not be a resectable candidate down the road. 
in addition to how much um, um, injury have I made to the brain, the possibility of SUDEP, sudden unexpected death of epilepsy, uh, suicide, depression, injury, falls. So um, short answer, if surgery is an option, that should be the answer. I shouldn't, I shouldn't put it aside while trying something else. Thank you. So we have three more minutes. So maybe I will just ask the last question. Um, so what is the sensitivity of um, SPECT uh, for, pedi for PET, sorry, for pediatric age group? So one, one question is asking regarding that five-year-old uh, patient, the third case. So that's a good question. Uh, um, so as far as sensitivity, so PET scan, is a, it's a metabolic test. So it will tell me my FDG, my FD glucose uh, metabolism in the different areas. So if I have an area of uh, metabolic um, dysfunction for any reason, either because I have a, a, um, a, a paucity of white matter in that area, because I, I functionally, I have a problem with the metabolism because of seizures or because of a tumor or because of something else, all what it will tell me, it will tell me the function. It will, tell, will not tell me the cause or the reason. So it's a good study. Now, um, to Dr. Kaufman's earlier point, if everything is concordant, then great, I'll take it. If I have significant lack of concordance, then, then I am not moving forward with surgery. If I have three of my four elements are, concord are concordant, that's when I might need something else. I might need to make, make sense of it. So um, it's actually a pretty good study, pretty good test. It is not probably the best to localize um, because it will tell me the whole area, the whole region. Um, but it can be used along with everything else, the EEG, the MRI, the ictal spec, which, which can do a pretty good job in, 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 in um, localizing along with everything else. Again, I, I cannot single out one study and say, this is what I rely on. I have to rely on all of the above and how they're concordant with each other. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are at the end of our uh... Uh, epic here um, cases. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Kaufman. Thank you very much, to Dr. Abdel Mati. And uh, um, many thanks for our presenter for these uh, interesting um, cases. Um, a very fruitful discussion. I hope the audience also have uh, learned a lot. Um, so uh, just a reminder for all our participants that this um, activity has been recorded so it can be seen at later time. Uh, you will have also a certificate of attendance and um, we will see you in future um, ILA education activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.